Feldick. Okay, and again, we're just going to jump right in where we left off. After all, this is just a Bible study, and uh, we don't always know how far we're going to get, but uh, whether it's a verse or two verse or a chapter, it doesn't make any difference. We're going to take it as it comes. And again, for all of those of you joining us on television, how we just thank you for your response. We thank you for your letters, your help financially. And uh, we just, uh, well, we just live for mail time. Now, that's all there's to it. Iris and I open every letter yet. I hope we don't get so big that we can't do that. Uh, we, we like to keep the personal touch of seeing every name that comes through and uh, reading your letters, your biographies, you tell us about yourselves. We, we enjoy every bit of it. We appreciate your requests for prayer and uh, believe you me, we, we take these things seriously. And uh, whenever we have a prayer request, we certainly honor that by taking it into the throne room. And so again, I just want you to know that we appreciate everything that you're doing and again for those of you here in the studio we couldn't do it without you and so all of us are working together and how we always have to thank the people that are helping in the ministry itself Jerry is here again today does all the transcribing for the books and uh, of course Margaret Rainwater isn't here today but she does all the bookkeeping she has a little help but not a lot and uh, Keith Decker gets everything ready for the printer and we just got so many people that put in their effort and their time, and uh, I just have to say thank you to everyone. Okay, uh, I think you're all aware now that all the past programs are available on video and on the little printed books that I was just giving Jerry credit for transcribing, and uh, they're word for word. Uh, we've had a lot of people say, all I gotta do is close my eyes and I can just hear you. So uh, they're not dressed up, they're not edited, but uh, they're pretty much what we teach on the air. And uh, if you're interested, you write to us or call us and we'll get the information out to you. All right, let's go right back where we left off, like I said, in Galatians chapter 1 and now verse 13, continuing on. And remember, as we've introduced the book of Galatians, Paul is frantically, frantically responding to false teaching that has come into the congregations that he had established up there in Asia Minor which of course is today what we call the land of Turkey, and Galatia was right down pretty much the middle of what is now Turkey, and especially I think the Galatian churches were probably in the southern half of that part of Turkey. And uh, they were being bombarded by false teachers who were claiming that they couldn't be saved by faith and faith alone. They had to circumcise, and they had to keep the law of Moses or they couldn't be saved. Ring a bell? Well, we don't have circumcision and uh, as such, but we've got a lot of other things that are in the same category. It's that which you can do, and that is which of works, and it does nothing but bring down the anathema of God himself. All right, now verse 13, continuing on, Paul says, You've heard of my manner of living in times past in the Jews' religion. Remember, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisee, he says in Philippians. I am positive he was a mem member of the Sanhedrin, and uh, as such, uh, and I'm glad that others have confirmed my thinking, he must have been a husband and father, or he wouldn't have been a member of the Sanhedrin. And I feel he was that because he says in Acts chapter 26 that when they were persecuting these Jewish believers and they were brought before the religious councils, he, along with others, voted to have them put to death or thrown in prison. So that tells us quite a bit right there. So he was, he was high up in the echelons of Judaism as it was known at the time of Christ and the temple worship. And now reading on how that beyond measure, beyond measure, in other words, it was despicable. I persecuted, brought under pressure the assembly of God. Now I use the word assembly here purposely because too many people get confused by thinking that the word church always means what we call the church, the body of Christ, and it doesn't. And I've put it on the board uh, several times in past. Maybe I should do it again. The word translated church in our New Testament is the Greek word ecclesia, and it can be spelled K or A or, or C, it doesn't make any difference. 
But the ecclesia and all it meant in its true translated form was a called out assembly. And it does not mean someone with pastors and bishops and deacons necessarily, although when Paul speaks of the body of Christ and the local church, yes, it does. All right, now the word ecclesia then was what Stephen referred to in Acts chapter 7 when he said the church in the wilderness. Remember that? The church in the wilderness. Well, that wasn't a church, but it was a called out assembly because God called Israel out of Egypt unto himself, and it was called an ecclesia. The group of Jewish believers in Jerusalem, they were a called out assembly. They had separated themselves from the run of the mill of Judaizers, and so they were an ecclesia. They were called out of sin. But I maintain they were not yet the body of Christ. And so back in Acts, another instance when it's anything but a, a spiritual group of people is when they rioted in Ephesus and they ran into the theater. They were a mob. They were rioting because of what the Apostle Paul had been accomplishing amongst those pagan people. And what's it called? An ecclesia. Now, fortunately, the King James translators at least didn't use the word church for that. So what do they use? Assembly. And so the assembly, see, was being addressed and were warned that the Roman authorities were going to call them into question. So we have to be careful how we let these terminologies either confuse us or set us straight. And so when he says here, I persecuted the church, I prefer the word assembly because that's what it was. It was a called out, separated group of Jews who I do not feel were as yet under the uh, terminology of the body of Christ, which is something so different. All right, take that for what it's worth. You may not agree with me, but that's fine. So he says, I persecuted the assembly of God and wasted it. Well, now let's go back to the book of Acts so that we get the scriptural account that you can see for yourself what he is talking about. And you go back to Acts chapter 7, and uh, let's just jump in at verse 57. And here we have Stephen now, who has addressed the leaders of the nation of Israel. And he's gone through that whole historical record of the nation. And he brings them up to the time of Christ's crucifixion and rejection and proclaims as Christ himself had been doing and as Peter had been doing in Pentecost and in the intervening chapters that he was the Christ, the Messiah of Israel. But Peter said back there in chapter 2 and 3, you killed him, you murdered him, but God raised him from the dead and he is still in a position to be your king. All right, now, like I said earlier on then, when Saul of Tarsus, that religious practitioner of Judaism, saw the inroads that Jesus of Nazareth and the Twelve were making to Judaism, he just, hey, he went into orbit, as we would say. And he fought it tooth and nail and was trying to stamp it out. All right, come down to verse 57. He was sincere, sincerely wrong but he was sincere in hating these Jews who had embraced Jesus of Nazareth. That's the best way I can put it. All right, verse 57. Then they cried, these Jewish leaders, they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears, and they ran upon him, that is Stephen, with one accord. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. You remember several programs back I told you that one definition or description of stoning was that it was obscene. Obscene, in other words, the body of that victim was just smashed and squashed with these stones and rocks to where it was just unbelievable. All right, now this is the death, of course, that they're bringing on Stephen. They're stoning him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Now, don't put him too young. He's 30-something, I'm pretty sure. He was about the same age as Christ. And so he's probably in his early or mid-30s. 
Verse 59, And they stoned Stephen, who was calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Uh, maybe I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to. We had a listener from somewhere out in TV land send us a tape of their pastor's previous Sunday morning sermon. And uh, it was a gem. I'll tell you what, I just listened to it from start to finish. It was a good one. And he made several points. I guess that's why I thought it was so good, where he agreed with me explicitly. And one of them was, and you've heard me say it on this program, it is not appropriate for us in this age of grace, in the post-resurrection era, to refer to the Lord as simply Jesus. That was his name of the flesh in humiliation. And this gentleman made the point, and that's why I'm repeating it. Never in all of the scriptural account did the apostles, the twelve, address him as Jesus. They called him either Lord or Master, but they never called him Jesus. Now, the ridiculers did, but his followers never did. And the same way here. Do you see it? That's what made me think of it. And uh, verse 59. And they stoned Stephen, who was calling upon God, and saying, Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord Jesus. See, and isn't that what I've said on this program sometime back? The only appropriate address for him today is either Christ or the Lord Jesus or the Lord Jesus Christ, or the Lord, but don't ever approach him as just Jesus. It is not scripturally apropos. All right, then read on. And uh, he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Jesus. No. What does he say? Lord. See? Lord. And the same way the Apostle Paul. Now, on one or two occasions, I know he uses the term Jesus. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is one of them. But always Paul says, the Lord Jesus Christ, or Christ, or Jesus Christ. Never Jesus alone. It's just not appropriate now after his resurrection. Well, there's another one. It's free for nothing. All right, now come on over to chapter 9, and we'll pick up a description of Saul of Tarsus in his hatred for anything connected to the followers of Christ. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. And Saul, the one we just read about in chapter 7. And Saul, yet or still <coughs> continuing, breathing out threatenings and what? Slaughter. Now, you remember I mentioned in a program or two that the Judaistic religious people had clout with Rome. They had quite a bit. And uh, it was just their own obstinacy that, that brought down the, uh, the city of Jerusalem by Titus. But the Romans had a lot of respect for Judaism. And I, I think I've mentioned it before in this program. The reason that they persecuted the Christian soul was that it was something totally new, and as the Jews accused of being, they, they treated it like some kind of a sect or something. But Judaism had the respect of the Roman authorities because it was considered one of the ancient religions. And another thing I, I've made on this program, I know I have, the Jews from one end of the Roman Empire to the other would send vast amounts of money to the temple as their offerings. Never was a dollar lost. Now, it wasn't called a dollar then, but you know what I mean. Never did they lose an ounce of those gifts that were sent to the temple because Rome recognized and protected it. Now, they also had enough clout, as I said before, that they could actually demand extradition of Jews that they wanted to deal with in their own religion and bring them back to Jerusalem. And that's why Saul had the authority to go to Damascus, which was outside of Israel. It was in Syria. 
and yet Rome permitted them to go to Damascus, arrest Jews, and literally drag them back to Jerusalem. See? It's amazing. All right, now read on. And so here they have slaughter. They were putting them to death against the disciples or the followers of the Lord. And they went to the high priest, or Paul Saul did, and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogue. See, he wasn't going to bother with the, the Syrian population. All he wanted were those Jews who had embraced faith in the Messiah. All right? And so he had letters to go to the synagogues in Damascus that if he found any of this way who were following Christ as his Messiah, whether they were men or women, that he might bring them bound under Jerusalem. He was vicious. He had no mercy. He didn't care whether they were young or old, whether they were men or women. If they had embraced Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah, Saul's attitude was, they're not worth living. Get rid of them. They are nothing but a threat to my religion. All right, got the picture? Now you come back to Galatians. And the poor man never got over that. I imagine as he suffered all of the ramifications of his apostleship, he must have constantly remembered it's coming around. What goes around comes around, and his was coming around. All right, so verse 13. How that beyond measure I persecuted, I literally, I chased them to the ends of my authority and wasted it. Wasted it. What does that mean? Utterly destroyed wherever he went. Now, he evidently had made so much headway in the area of Jerusalem and Judea that he thought he had pretty much cleaned house and there wasn't anything left to do. So he says, okay, high priest, let me go to Damascus. There are still some of these people up there, and we know there were, even from archaeological digging, that a lot of these Jewish believers who had to flee Jerusalem for fear of Saul's and the other religious persecution, a lot of them did uh, migrate up to the area of Galilee, um, trying to think of the name of the one city in particular. It's right not too far from Beth Shan. But there was a, a community that the archaeologists have now found that identifies them as Jews who had been followers of, of Christ. See? And so evidently some of them had, of course, even gone up as far as Damascus. All right, back to Galatians chapter 1, verse 14. Not only was he a religious zealot, who had no mercy, who had no compunction in putting these Jewish believers to death. On top of that, what else motivated him? Money. Ring a bell? Money. He profited in the Jews' religion. Now, I've always told my classes, and I think, again, I've even put it on the program. You go into any religion of the world, and you go into their headquarters, their upper echelons, what do you find? Wealth. Wealth. Tremendous wealth. And where have they gotten it? From the peons down there on the lower levels. Judaism was no different. Why? No, this is all common sense. Why did Jesus drive out the money changers in the temple? What was going on? Hey, it was graft. It was corruption. These poor people living out in the little small alleys and huts of Jerusalem, they couldn't afford to go and go out to maybe one of the flocks out in the Judean hills and, and buy a nice, beautiful lamb and bring it to the temple. They couldn't afford that, nor did they have whatever it took to do that. So what did they have to do? Well, they had to buy some kind of a sacrifice for some kind of a, of a peon's wage in order to fulfill the demands of their religion. And so what were these religious leaders setting up? A marketplace. And they would charge 10 prices for 
whatever these poor people had to have, whether it was a turtle dove or maybe it was a little lamb that had something wrong with and wasn't all that good, see, and that was the thing that God had as a controversy with Israel. They were to bring a lamb without blemish. But see, these rascals of Israel were taking advantage of the poor people and selling them the off-scouring of stuff that they could use for a sacrifice and charging them bloated prices. Why? Hey, the same motivation that people have today to what? To get rich. And you see, old Saul was right in the middle of that. He was making big bucks. Now, if you don't believe me, you've got to go with us to Jerusalem. And usually we get a chance to go down and see the home of Caiaphas, the high priest. Dug out of the archaeological diggings. Now, quite a few feet below street level. But even after all these 2,000 years of laying under the dirt and the sand of the Middle East, you can see by the material that was on their walls and with all the bathrooms that they had, that they lived sumptuously. Sumptuously. In fact, in one area of, of that house, you can see three or four layers where like our guide pointed out, you know, Cava's wife must have gone to Athens and she came back and she says, Honey, we've got to have this on our wall because after all, that's what all the rich people in Athens had. Well, well, okay, okay, we will do it. So then maybe a year or two later she went to Rome and she saw something that was even prettier and she came back and she says, Honey, she said, You've got what it takes. I've got to have this new material on our walls. And he says, Well, well, okay. And so there were about four layers, and you could see that each one was beautiful and must have cost tremendous amounts of money. They lived sumptuously. Why? Because they were feeding off of the income from that religion. A religion has always been that way. And I tell people, look at any religion on the face of the earth tonight, and you go up into the higher echelons and you'll find the same thing. It hasn't changed. The human race hasn't changed one iota in 6,000 years. As they get corrupt and they get more, they get more corrupt and they get more. And who was it, the old boy that said, I can't remember, but I'll never forget how it goes when they, I've lost it. Corruption? Huh? Yeah, and he all, Total corruption breeds total corruption. That's not right. I had it a moment ago, but I've lost it. But anyway, you know what it means. The more corrupt people, the more corrupt they get. And it just keeps feeding on them. Listen, this was Saul of Tarsus. That's the point I'm trying to make. This guy was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was corrupt in the religion. He didn't have any mercy for those who opposed it. And so he could drag them in, throw them into the dungeons, or commit them to stoning. Never bothered him. All right, read on. It's his account, not mine. And he says, you have heard of my manner of living. Oh, in verse 14, I profited in the Jews' religion. Now, those of you who have heard me teach for the last many years, you know I detest the word religion. Because the Bible always uses it in a bad light. I think in the book of James is probably an exception when James says, he that is religious will bridle his tongue or something like that. But for the most part, the word religion in Scripture is a bad word, just like it is here. Paul says, I was profiting in the Jews' religion. See? Because it was a bad, corrupt system. Now, I don't have to tell you that. All you have to do is go back and read Jesus' account with those Pharisees, and what were they? They were corrupt. You remember when one of them smited Paul on the face? What did Paul call him? You whited sepulcher. Now, that's a pretty strong language. He had to take it back because he said, I didn't know he was a high priest. Well, I think there's more there than reads between the lines. But whatever, that's what he called him. He said, why, you whited sepulcher? How dare you strike me? And then they come back and said, can you call the high priest that? Oh, he says, I didn't know he was a high priest. Well, whatever. 
Reading on in verse 14, we have a few seconds left. So he says, I profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation. In other words, he was probably making more bucks than most of them. Why? Because I was being more exceedingly zealous of the what? Traditions. See, religion always banks on tradition, doesn't it? Not doctrine, but tradition. And see, we're, I'm building up. I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready that when we get a little further in Galatians, we're going to see that times haven't changed one iota in 2,000 years. All we're not dealing with circumcision. We're not dealing with Pharisees and Judaism, but we're dealing with the same kind of a mentality. It's the same thing. It's religion and all of its demands on poor, unsuspecting people. But all oh, now look what he says. Being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my what? Fathers. In other words, Saul was proud of his genealogy, and he probably was even able to trace it clear back into the Old Testament economy. And remember that his father must have been some kind of a man of influence. What? Because he was already a Roman citizen. Because Paul, remember, when he is brought under arrest by the Romans, what does he, what does he claim? I'm a Roman citizen. And he said, how could you afford to buy it? It cost me all kinds. And Paul says, I didn't have to buy it. I was what? Freeborn. See? I was born a Roman citizen. So that tells you something about his father and probably even his grandfather. But whatever, all these come into play now when you look at the man's religious fanaticism. He was a zealot, and he didn't care who he hurt. He didn't care who he condemned to death. If he could stamp out all these Jews who had followed Christ, then he thought he was the winner.